In this video, there's just a few really cool videos that kind of keep piling up and I don't really get a chance to use them because they don't really fit any specific AI story. So really fast, I just wanted to play a few of these with minimal commentary, just because I want to know what you think about these. These are very cool. And there's issues sometimes working other people's videos into my video. I once played a quick like five second clip from Seinfeld and then Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld, millionaires both, decided to hit me with a copyright thing. It's fine. It's cool. Whatever. Let's start with this one. So here's a gentleman running around doing laps around his office and the AI vision in real time is picking up what he's doing and describing what he's doing. It's going so fast. I have to literally pause this to see what it's saying. So to me, the AI vision is kind of the next big frontier. We're already seeing great things with GPT-4 vision. Once it's this fast, it's this accurate. I mean, it can do pretty much anything. It can play a video game. It can navigate the browsers, navigate a computer just like a human being would. This is where things get very interesting. Next, if you were ever interested to see what happens inside a large language model, what happens with these neural nets, there are some pretty cool visualizations that are available. This one is, I would say, probably the best. And really to get a really good understanding, you would have to actually visit the link and go through it yourself. So here's, if I zoom out, you kind of see the various architectures here. So this is GPT-3, this massive thing. But if you wanted to kind of visualize what's happening on the smallest level, you can see, you can take a look at Nano GPT, and you can kind of zo zoom in and see each layer, each, each piece of the architecture, where you have the bias, the weight, you can see how the attention matrix, the attention output works. I'll be honest, I have kind of a conceptual understanding of how it works, but I, I would have a hard time explaining what each of these pieces do. But I'm definitely looking forward to messing around with this a little bit and trying to understand it better. And I think this is really effective for that. Number one, this is just a web page that I'm moving around with my mouse. Like if I hold down the middle mouse button, I can rotate it in 3D space can zoom in and see what each one of these pieces are. And here on the left, it actually explains what happens as you go through this process. So for example, here we're using nano GPT, the smallest sort of possible thing on this list. It's kind of like one of those things where they show you how big the stars and the planets and the suns and the galaxies are. When you zoom out, you start to kind of get a feel for how big some of these models are. And this is the GPT-3. Now imagine GPT-4, even, you know, many times bigger than that. But here with the nano GPT, for example, what happens when we do something super simple on this tiny model of 85,000 parameters, right? Because now we're referring to models that have 7 billion parameters. That's kind of like small. Those are small models. This is 85,000. So what happens when we try to sort these letters in alphabetical order? C, B, A, B, B, C. The input is made into a token. And here each token is assigned a number. And next, those numbers become an embedding. Here's what that looks like. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but if you were interested in doing this, this is one of the absolute best visualizations that I've seen. And keep in mind that these neural nets, they're kind of an abstraction of the human brain. They're kind of modeled after how the floating combination of fat and proteins in your very own head, how that behaves. Was that too weird of a way of explaining it? it, it it's your brain. That's what it's made of. I'll leave a link down below, but it's certainly interesting because what you're looking at is the architecture that turns data whether well, that's images or numbers or words or letters, and it turns it into some other data. But this part, the thing that makes it happen, that's intelligence. This is what intelligence looks like in the abstract digital realm. Now, on this channel, we've covered a few studies that are showing that it seems that these neural nets, that they build a world model, a certain, a certain mental model of what they believe the world to be. It's kind of hard to even describe what they're doing because all these terms like believe or think or understand, like we don't have really good definitions for them and, and we don't have sort of a different set of words to use for language models. But when people say that these models, all they're doing is predicting the next word and they kind of say maybe a little bit dismissively like, oh, they can't do this. They're just predicting the next word. Yeah, that's technically true. They are just predicting the next word, but how they're going about it, that's the mind blowing part. Because as we give them data and we ask them to make guesses, inferences about that data, in order to become better at making those guesses, they're building a model of their world, of the world that they need to understand in order to make those predictions. Take a listen. The way to think about it is that when we train a large neural network to accurately predict the next word mm -hmm. in lots of different texts from the internet, what we are doing is that we are learning a world model. 
it looks like we are learning this. It may, it may look on the surface that we are just learning statistical correlations in text. But it turns out that to just learn the statistical correlations in text, to compress them really well, what the neural network learns is some representation of the process that produced the text. This text is actually a projection of the world. There is a world out there and it has a projection on this text. And so what the neural network is learning is more and more aspects of the world, of people, of the human conditions, their, their, their hopes, dreams and motivations, their interactions and the situations that we are in. And the neural network learns a compressed, abstract, usable representation of that. Mm -hmm. This is what's being learned from accurately predicting the next word. And furthermore, the more accurate you are at predicting the next word, the higher the fidelity, the more resolution you get in this process. Next, we have this ability to create pictures and videos pretty much as fast as you can type. You type in what you want, train in space, and then you have multitudes of variations on that theme. If you wait on one long enough, it turns into a video. This is what video production will look like in the future. Type in what you want, find the look that you're going for, and then watch it animate in front of your eyes. Train on Mars. Now it becomes, everything becomes train on Mars, and here it is animated. Here's this video really fast. Take a look and see what you think. What if I could be more positive? Less anxious, less obsessive, less judgmental. What if I could change my inner monologue? Yes, I'm here, can you hear me? Hello Kyle, I'm the voice in your head. Kyle McDonald and I have been developing a new system where the people I interact with, the places I go, the things I do, are guided by an AI-enhanced voice that speaks to me the way I'd like to be spoken to. Now, we want to share this with you. For me, I want, just want to be more positive, it seems like, um, and say things that are more positive energy to other people. I'd like to slow down, kind of take it all in, uh, realize I'm not on stage. As you talk to it and train it to support you, it will clone the sound of your voice and speak to you. I will support you. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. I'm optimistic. Let me help you. Now, that's a little bit creepy, as some people have said. I mean, for some people, this will be very exciting. I think that some people maybe struggle with being positive. So certainly having a coach that helps you focus or be positive or maybe walks you through certain situations, that would be a good thing. I'm very excited about having a coach that helps me get stuff done and move forward and kind of not get distracted. Certainly having an AI whisper in your ear, I could see how that would be good. Obviously, it could also be bad if somebody else that owns the model and owns the weights, what if they hijack it to get you to do their bidding? That's a scary situation. So what we just watched to me, if it's open source, I think this will be a very beautiful positive thing. If it's a giant corporation that's controlling it, that is very, very scary. If I told you this was Muhammad Ali's gloves, would you believe me? Let me ask it a different way. If you had two choices, A, these are the actual gloves of Muhammad Ali, or B, these are just some other gloves, would you pick A or would you pick B? The answer is these are neither. They're not gloves. They're not real. They're not there. Everything else is the table, the laptop, the picture of Muhammad Ali, the books in the background. This is a real room in a real house with real sunlight and fake gloves, as in they're not there. They're augmented reality. They don't exist. Now, let me play just one more time and see if you can kind of maybe, now that you're aware that they're augmented reality and they're placed there uh, sort of by a computer, 
I, I I feel like you could almost see a little bit of them maybe twitching a little bit in the real space. If you've ever played uh, with the VR goggles, you kind of sometimes, you know kind of what I'm talking about. Sometimes, you know, things shift a little bit or if you accidentally knock the goggles you're wearing, kind of the world like twitches a little bit. And I feel like you can kind of pick up on that here just a little bit. Or maybe I just feel that way because I now know that they're not real. But I got to say, it's really, really getting hard to tell the difference. Those look very real. This is an autonomous robot that is working on basically synthesizing new, never before seen materials. It starts with Google's DeepMind, a project they called GNOME, that basically predicts different material structures for these never before seen materials. They kind of make a recipe for it. And then this robotic arm goes to work trying to replicate it. I've, we did a full coverage of this in a different video. And they're finding that they're able to recreate those with a high degree of accuracy, something like 76%, if I recall correctly. So an AI dreams up new materials and says, here's how I think you could create this material. And then this robotic arm autonomously goes to work trying to make that dream a reality. In the future, we'll believe that this is the way that we'll build better semiconductors, better batteries, better microchips, and potentially also better building materials, maybe even better medicines, etc. All of this is done autonomously. And at this point, the amount of materials that, that this process has created is many, many more times bigger than what we as humans have discovered. So AI plus robots is the next wave of science. So sometime earlier today, I've crossed a heck of a milestone. I wanted to do a long speech about how thankful I am and how together we can make this world a better place. But then I remembered what a wise man once said. Don't use it as a, a platform to make a political speech, right? You're in no position to lecture the public about anything. You know nothing about the real world. Most of you spent less time in school than Greta Thunberg. So, if you win, right, come up, accept your little award, thank your agent and your god. And so no, but with all that, seriously, thank you. From people who find my jokes funny to the nastiest trolls, I love you and... Thank you for being part of this journey. All right, I'm done patting myself on the back. My name is Wes Roth. Thank you for watching.